Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simiou. And on this edition, we'll be looking back at the victory over Burnley on Saturday. Arsenal back to winning ways after a couple of disappointing results at Southampton and, of course, at home to Spurs in the Carabao Cup. Very important uh, that we got back to winning ways on Saturday and, and restored some faith amongst the supporters. A few people had been questioning Unai Emery's methods, me included. Um, and I've still got some questions about some of his selections, some of his methods, but that's OK. We're allowed to question a manager. Um, I know that we wanted Arsene Wenger gone badly. Um, a lot of us did. Um, but that doesn't mean that just because we've replaced him, we can never question the replacement. Um, so uh, I said that on the last podcast and I want to make that point again because for me, um, you know, as someone who likes to analyse the game and look into the ins and outs of it and, and really study things, I get irritated when people say I'm being negative. No, I'm not being negative. I'm happy. And I think Arsenal have done brilliantly this season um, considering the targets that we sort of had in mind and how we thought this season was going to go before it started. So Arsenal are doing well, fantastically well. We've been on a great run um, and unfortunately that run came to an end at Southampton, but that doesn't mean it's panic stations. But equally, I think we can safely say that the manager's got a few things wrong in the last couple of games that have contributed uh, to our, our downfall, I guess. Well, downfall is probably the wrong word. To our results uh, taking a dip. I think that's the way to put it. Going to start off by talking about Unai Emery's initial team selection. He went back to the back four. Finally, um, something I've been calling for for quite some time now. Um, not because I disagree with the back three, but more so because we just haven't had the personnel and we still don't have the personnel available at this moment in time uh, to play that way. And it's causing us problems because ultimately you end up playing with a couple of players in that back three. Um, being played completely out of position. And for me, that is a worry. And it's something that you cannot get away with at this level. So he went back to the back four, um, burned Leno in goal. Socrates and Monreal were the two centre-backs. Said Kalasinac returned to the team at left-back. Ainsley Maitland-Niles uh, carried on at right-back. And then there was a midfield trio of Granit Xhaka, Matteo Guendouzi and Mohamed Elneny. Um, him getting his first start in the Premier League, I think since May, um, which is astonishing really, isn't it? He hasn't played a Premier League game from the start for Arsenal since May. Um, a player who recently was given a new contract as well. So uh, make of that what you will. Um, I personally think that Mohamed Elneny is a squad player, um, but it's it's how long he'll be happy uh, only doing that role. And that that's the key, isn't it? Can you keep these kind of squad players happy uh, before they eventually get fed up and say, do you know what, I'm off. Um, but yeah, Mohamed Elneny came in, looked rusty for me, um, but I'll come on to that in a moment. Uh, Mesut Ozil was back in the side after all the talk of him uh, seemingly heading for the exits. Mesut Ozil was given the captain's armband too, which was to many people's uh, surprise. So I guess that kind of kills the, the rumour, doesn't it, that him and Unai Emery have had this massive falling out. Because if that was the case, you wouldn't make him captain, would you? Uh, so I, I, for one have been pretty um, cautious about talking about the Ozil-Emery thing because I don't think there's any evidence to suggest there's been a massive falling out other than hearsay. That's all it is, isn't it? People talking um, and, and the fact is they don't really know uh, what's gone on. And then, of course, Aubameyang Lacazette um, up top. So um, initially when we started the game, you know, I spoke on the last podcast about Unai Emery's uh, philosophy and the fact that he wants his centre-backs to pull wide uh, to make the pitch as big as possible and he wants his full-backs to push on um, further up the pitch and I, I've spoken also before about my concern that it leaves a gaping hole in the middle here but what I saw um, on Saturday which I hadn't seen too often um, already this season was was the likes of Gwenduzi or El Elneny or Xhaka whoever it was, just dropping into that position there um, and just cleaning up and going there to give the centre-backs an option when they receive the ball um, and just creating that extra position, that extra third man, if you like, that we're missing because we can't play um, in the way that perhaps Unai Emery wants to 
due to the injuries that we have and suspensions and, and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, that was interesting to see. Now, Mesut Ozil, for me, was was key again on Saturday. Um, I know people have spoken about him not doing enough and how he shouldn't be in the team. But for me, he's Arsenal's most creative influence. And I don't think you can even really sensibly debate that. Um, you know, when you think about his vision, his technical ability, I don't think we have another player like that in and amongst the squad. I kind of hoped that Henrik Mkhitaryan was going to be that player, but he hasn't uh, turned out to be the player I thought he was. He's a lot more hardworking than I thought he was, but he's definitely not as creative as Mesa Ozil. And I think Mesa Ozil's pass for the opener, um, where he bent the ball, uh, it, it, it looked like an impossible angle, didn't it? It looked like it was an impossible pass. Sad Kalasinac was not even in the frame of the picture when you watched the replay. But he's obviously anticipated it. Mesa Ozil has put the right spin, the right weight on the ball. And ultimately, we've carved Burnley open there and opened the scoring. So that's the difference that Mesa Ozil can make. That's the quality that he has. And that's the impact that he can have on a game. He can carve a defense open with one pass. And for me, even when he's not having a great game, just having that on the pitch, just having that in your locker means everything and and Arsenal have missed him in the last few weeks I feel um I feel that we missed his creativity in a couple of games yes there are games you know probably against some of the bigger sides where you probably say I'd pick hard work over Mesa Ozil and I get that but that's the whole point of having a squad isn't it football is a squad game if it was up to me Mesa Ozil would be a starter every week but I know a lot of people disagree with that and that's fine that's fair but you cannot deny his contribution to the win over Burnley because uh, I've seen a lot of people doing that um, on various channels since the game. And, you know, I, I get it that you don't like him. I get it that you're fed up with him. And I get it that you don't think he performs regularly enough. But to deny his impact on that game, it, for me, is just lying. Because you're just choosing not to see something because it doesn't suit your argument. And, you know, I, I get wound up by that. I get frustrated by that. So... That's enough about Ozil. I'm not going to keep going on and on and on about him. The pass was fantastic. I thought he was... Um, he done well on the third goal to step inside and carve out some space. I know he was probably having a shot. Fortunately for us, it fell to Alex Iwobi who finished it. And I guess, you know, when Alex Iwobi scores, you know you're having a good day. Um, so that was great to see. But Mesut Ozil was given a freedom today, uh, on Saturday, sorry. And that freedom was given to him because... We had the midfield behind him that we did. We had Granit Xhaka there. We had Matteo Guendouzi there. And we had Mohamed Elneny there. So there was plenty of work right there. And there was a lot of uh, defensive awareness, shall we say. Maybe not from Granit Xhaka, but Matteo Guendouzi. Um, and in particular, Mohamed Elneny. He's quite conscious, isn't he, of his defensive responsibilities. So in particular, Elneny provided a bit more cover uh, meaning that Ozil could do this, you know, he could pull out to the right and link up with Lacazette. He could pull out to the left, link up with Aubameyang and Kalasinac and, and, and make things happen. And Ozil does that quite a bit. Um, if you think of some of the better games that Mesut Ozil's had for Arsenal over the years, you'd probably say that most of them were when he was pulling out sort of to this left hand side alongside Alexis Sanchez and trying to make things happen. One twos coming away from the concentrated area on the edge of the box and, and trying to make things happen from a wider position. Mesut Ozil has always done that. But in order to get the best out of him, you have to allow him that freedom. If you don't, um, and, and you're very rigid and you're asking him to, to cover defensively, then you're kind of taken away from Mesut Ozil what Mesa Ozil does best. And then he's a luxury player that you're not getting the benefit out of, so you might as well keep him out of the team. So he's one of those players, isn't he, that if you can find a way of making it work for you, the team, and him, then great. If you can't, then you're kind of missing out on that spark, and that spark is what we saw for the first goal. Um, another thing I want to touch on from the game was... Uh, the fact that after Nacho Monreal got injured and was replaced, I think it was on the 37th minute, Unai Emery decided to, to change the system. He instantly asked Granit Xhaka to drop back into the centre-back position. He asked Socrates to move into the middle here. And then he put Stefan Licksteiner on the right of the three. Now, 
what does that tell us? What does that tell us? The fact that he started the game with a back four, lost Nacho Monreal, brought Stefan Licksteiner on and immediately changed to a back three. That tells me that Unai Emery doesn't have faith in Stefan Licksteiner as a centre-back. Because if he did, he'd have left him as the second one alongside Socrates. The fact he doesn't um, meant that Granit Xhaka had to drop back and make it into a back three. Now, I actually thought Arsenal were a lot more dominant uh, when we were playing with a back four. Yes, you know, when we needed the protection, one of those midfield three was dropping back into that space uh, just around here to sort of cover and pick up balls and create angles for the rest of the defence. But when we went back to the, the back three, I thought we kind of invited Burnley onto us a little bit. We lost a bit of a foothold in the middle of the park. Not that we were playing brilliantly before that, but we just... We lost an extra body in there. We lost that extra bit of bite. We lost a bit of composure that Granit Xhaka brings in that position. Um, and as a result, you know, Burnley came on quite strongly uh, during certain periods of the game. So the halftime whistle came and Arsenal were winning a game at halftime. Yes, uh, you don't need to rewind it. I did say that we were winning a game at halftime. Something we've not been used to this season. Um, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, it wasn't long before Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang bagged the second. Um, and, and what I thought Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang and, and Lacazette did really well yesterday um, was work the channels. They worked the channels really well. Um, I thought Aubameyang uh, made this area of the pitch count, especially in the first half. Uh, there were some runs on the outside where he kind of drifted out to that left Thierry Henry-like position, as I like to call it. Um, and, and Lacazette was doing that too on the right-hand side. Um, and they were sort of pulling the defence apart and, and creating the spaces for, for the likes of Ozil to work in, which was great. Now, of course, Aubameyang's goal, um, it came from a breakaway. Lacazette, uh, I think, was the last person to play the ball to him. He took it into the penalty area and, and finished expertly. And Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang... You know, his stats speak for themselves, don't they? He's an, a lethal finisher, top scorer in the Premier League um, at the close of play yesterday. So uh, fair play to him, you know, brilliant. And I've been critical of him at times. I think that he drifts in and out of football matches. But his goal record is brilliant, isn't it? And that really cannot be questioned. When a player is bringing in that sort of goal return, I guess a manager can't drop him. I guess he becomes undroppable in a sense. Um, and, you know, he's he's brilliant isn't he he's, he's done brilliantly again Alexander Lacazette was withdrawn a little bit later on um, he looked a little bit pissed off when he came off I'm not gonna lie um, I've seen it back on TV since I was at the game so I'll be honest I didn't really notice it too much at the game you could see he looked a little bit dejected to come off but he's a striker who didn't score on the day and, and probably was a little bit frustrated at that he, he came off, um, Unai Emery, I think, said in the post-match press conference that he likes seeing a striker disappointed he didn't score. Um, you know, they may have had some words after the game, who knows. But it's hunger, in it? There's a hunger there uh, from Alex Lacazette that we didn't really see much last season. And, and for me, you know, I know people talk about players that have improved and, and he's not one that's normally spoken about. But for me, he's definitely up there. Uh, his attitude has completely changed. He looks willing to fight, willing to battle. And, and I feel a little bit sorry for him, actually. Um, he got a start on Saturday, but it's been a long time coming, hasn't it? And for the past few weeks, I've been wondering what he has to do to get a start. I think he's performed every time he's been on the pitch of late. So um, fair play to Alex Lacazette and another wonderful performance uh, from him, I thought. Probably not his best in terms of outputs, but in terms of what he put into the performance, work rate, uh, determination, grit, y you've got to give that to him. So, uh, well done, Alex Lacazette. Now, I, another player I want to talk about is Ser Kolasinac. He was given the Man of the Match award, and rightly so. Um, he just bombs up and down that left-hand side, doesn't he? And maybe that plays a huge part in why Emery likes to play a back three um, when he's in the side, because he worries about the spaces that he leaves in behind him. That would be fair, I suppose. Um, but what he does for me is, you know, he when he gets forward, he gets forward with such power. And the quality of his cutbacks across goal are, are pretty good, aren't they? I mean, nine times out of ten, he'll pick someone out. Um, 
and and we've seen when we, we've been without him how much we miss his influence in an attacking sense. He's one of our main attacking outlets at the moment, as was Hector Bellerin before he got injured. So it's vital uh, that if we're going to keep playing the Unai Emery way, we need to have competent players in those positions. Might be worth going out and getting a couple in the transfer window because from what I've seen this season, Nacho Monreal is going to struggle to stay fit. When he is fit, I still don't think he's as effective going forward as Sea Kolasinac is. And for Hector Bellerin, we just don't have a like-for-like -like replacement. I know a lot of people said in the summer we'd got Licksteiner in and, and that was our number two right back. But Licksteiner, for me, isn't capable of doing what Hector Bellerin does uh, on a weekly basis. So, um, yeah, there are definitely a couple of positions to think about, aren't they? And and when I said about Aubameyang using those channels well, um, here's a little bit of a demonstration for those of you watching on YouTube. I'll try and explain it to those on the audio. You know, Aubameyang often... He pulls out to the left flank and, and what he does is he he gets the attention of the right-sided defender. The right-sided defender now is aware of him and aware of his presence and his presence can cause uncertainty um, amongst defenders. And what that does is that allows Ser Kolasinac often to make the overlapping run undetected. So a lot of Ser Kolasinac getting into those positions is because... The space has been created for him. Defenders have been pulled away. Defenders have been distracted. So if Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang pulls out to that left-hand side, he, he gets the attention of the defender and ultimately creates the space for Kalasinac to come bombing up and down here, often undetected and often with the momentum. And that's why it's so effective. Um, I think uh, against Spurs, we didn't really see that the other night. We didn't see spaces created for Monreal to get forward. Um but equally, he, he, he doesn't do it enough, does he? he he's, and that's not a criticism of him. It's just not his game. He's, he's more of a defender's defender, if you like, uh, a conventional defender. Say Kolasinac is your modern-day wing-back and um, is definitely more suited to this side. I'd like to see Monreal slot in as a centre-back because um, I think he's better in that position than some of our actual centre-backs. But that's another story for another day. Just on the subject of centre-backs, though, uh, Socrates, another one who... Was in with a good shout for man of the match. I thought he was splendid on Saturday. Um, didn't shy away from the physical battle. Wasn't afraid to give it out um, to some of those Burnley players. I think with him, the good thing about him is that he's enough of a shithouse to not be intimidated and, and to give it back to opponents. But also he's clever enough not to get caught. He's clever enough in the way he goes about it. He winds people up. Um, and, and also we saw him barking out a load of instructions on Saturday, particularly when he was playing alongside Licksteiner and Xhaka, who, of course, were playing out of position. Um, I remember one free kick that Burnley took, and, and I think the player dummy to take it. The whole defence pushed up. Um, Burnley had pulled a fast one over us. Half of them sort of pushed, half of them stayed, and, and Burnley were in. But Socrates got back and made the tackle, and he literally ran straight up to Granite Xhaka and gave him an absolute blasting. And, you know, that's what I like to see. It's for the good of the team. Um, you know, he knows the position inside out. He's very aware of what's around him all the time. Um, he's quicker than we thought he was, but he's still not blisteringly quick, is he? Um, and he's not particularly technically gift, uh, gifted, sorry. But what he is, is he's very smart in the way he goes about his work and he's a real addition to this team. And, and I'm glad uh, that we signed him after being a little bit um, unsure when he was signed, it has to be said. Now, obviously, Burnley... Uh, pulled the goal back and made it 3-1 and, and I've uh, sorry 2-1 at the time and I've got to say I was absolutely fuming when that went in we just had so many opportunities to clear the ball it wasn't done we were messing about in in our penalty area the same problems that we've seen so often uh, from this Arsenal team dilly-dallying on the ball and ultimately it cost us Burnley uh, got themselves back into the game and had a decent little spell after that it's got to be said um, but Arsenal done well to be resilient and, and tough and, and make sure that we didn't crumble uh, in that situation. So um, then, of course, we go down the other end and get the third and, and that's game over, isn't it? Um, Alex Iwobi scoring and it was a good finish, to be fair. He took it well. Uh, probably was, like I've mentioned already, an attempted shot from Mesut Ozil, but it doesn't matter, does it? Um, it ended up in the back of the net and Ultimately, Ozil's had an impact on two of the three goals. And I guess you could say that's the difference between winning and drawing, isn't it? And you could say the same about Kalasinac. He 
had influence as well um, on a lot of our attacking play. But it's a team game, isn't it? I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that Mesa Ozil does have an influence in this football team, and particularly on Saturday. And let's just acknowledge that and move on. Um, you know, some difficult games coming up. There's no need to be infighting about whether or not Mesa Ozil should be starting. That's the least of our worries at the moment. And just finally, I want to talk about uh, Sean Dyche's post-match comments. Um, I actually like Sean Dyche. I think he's a good manager. I think he's done well, given that he's been working at a club, probably aside from Bournemouth, maybe the smallest club in the division. Um, they struggle for money badly. Um, and you know, in comparison to their others, the others, so they don't struggle for money, but they struggle in comparison to some of the teams around them. And he's always done very well. And so it disappoints me to see him uh, give post-match interviews and press conferences like the one he did. It just sounded like sour grapes to me. You know, he's talking about diving. Um, he's talking about uh, goals being marginally offside. And I just think it's pathetic. You know, his team came there with zero intentions of playing football. They came there to rough us up. Um, Burnley seemed to have made progress last season, but it looks to me as though they've regressed. And as a result of their poor start to the season, Sean Dyche has just had to go back to basics, um, back to being bully boys, back to trying to force the issue, the long ball, the set pieces. Um, I'm not saying they ever completely turned away from that, but they certainly had made some progress. Uh, but uh, yeah, they've gone back to basics, haven't they? And for a manager to come out and say stuff like that without taking into account what his own team did, uh, you know, it just came across as sour grapes. And I think the whole football world share that view. I don't think that's just a view exclusive to us Gooners. I think a lot of people were disappointed in his reaction after that game. And, you know, he's not done himself any favours, has he? And that brings us to the end of another Chronicles of Aguna. This is, of course, the last episode before Christmas. So I'd like to wish every single one of you... Um, a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year. We'll be back, I think, after the Brighton game. Uh, we'll make sure we get something done. It might be a little bit shorter. Um, of course, it's the holiday season. Everything's going on. Uh, friends, family, occasions, um, dinners, meetings with people and stuff. So, yeah, I can't guarantee it'll be a long episode, but I will definitely get something out after the Brighton game. So thank you once again to every single one of you for watching. Uh, throughout the year and, and a Merry Christmas to you and your families. May 2019 bring you all good health and happiness. <laughs>